become enrollment, dual credit, college and high school, lots of different names for it. My name is Brandon Purvis. I'm the strategy director at Complete College in America. And I'm really thrilled and honored to be able to introduce two close colleagues of mine. This is Amy Williams. She's the executive director at NASEP, the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships. And Alex Perry, he is the coordinator at the College and High School Alliance. And uh, couldn't ask for two better people as well as two better organizations we're going to present today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate it. And thank you to the Complete College America team for inviting Amy and I to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Yeah, we're really excited to dive in uh, onto the topic of uh, dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, early college, high school, PTEC, um, many different terms. Well, a, it wouldn't be a dual enrollment uh, presentation without a slide on terminology. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, but uh, before we did that, wanted to just introduce you just ever so quickly to uh, our organizations uh, and the work that we do. Uh, I'm Alex Perry. Uh, I work for a DC-based education policy consulting firm called Foresight Law and Policy, but I spend most of my time as the coordinator of the College and High School Alliance. The College and High School Alliance is a coalition of 90 national and state organizations who are interested in advocating on behalf of equity, quality, and student success in college and high school programs. We're governed by a steering committee of seven organizations, one of which is the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships. So Amy, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, Amy Williams, Executive Director for NASEP, the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships, which does get to be a mouthful. That's why we call ourselves NASEP often. Uh, we serve basically three areas of work to support and advance the field of dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, dual credit, early college, all of those terms that uh, Alex rattled off. We work in the policy space to advance these programs. We support programs as a program accreditor and we support practitioners as the go-to space for professional development to understand, advance, align, and innovate within this field. And as Alex mentioned, we are one of the steering committee members, and we do like to say we are one of the founding steering committee members of the College and the High School Alliance. And we really leverage and work with the College and the High School Alliance to uh, elevate the voice for these programs on the national level and build coordination between the different varieties of these programs so that we can speak in the policy space with a shared shared and common voice with shared and common initiatives. So before we dive into the meat of the presentation, as Brandon alluded to, as I alluded to, and as Amy has now alluded to, obviously terminology in this space is just a massive challenge. There are, according to a 2013 analysis by the Higher Learning Commission, 38 terms used in state policy to describe the act of a high school student taking a college class as part of a partnership between a school district and an institution of higher education that leads to transcripted college credit. And some of those terms you may use in your state and some of those terms you may not. Dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, early college, high school, PTEC, blah, 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 blah. Um, you will hear us use probably dual enrollment or college and high school programs interchangeably throughout the course of this presentation. Me Really translate that in your own mind into whatever terminology it is that you are used to using. There are some subtle variations in the different kinds of models of dual enrollment. The early college high school is a little different from what people will traditionally understand the concurrent enrollment model to be, for example. But for our purposes, we're focused more on the things that unite us than that divide us. And so we're talking about any program in which a high school student has the opportunity to take a college class as part of a partnership between a school district and an institution of higher education that leads to transcripted college credit, regardless of where the student takes the classes, what kind of instructor they have, what kind of classes they're taking, we're really thinking about that whole bucket of programs. So we'll use dual enrollment college and high school programs specifically, interchangeably, but um, please, as I say, translate them back to uh, your own uh, uh, lingo in your local or state area. So uh, with that, hopefully we will, um, uh, everything from this point forward will make sense and Amy, why don't you kick us off with the national landscape for dual enrollment? Yeah, let's talk about what we know about how prevalent these programs are and how uh, well, in, well they are doing in terms of engaging students on the national level. So we don't really, uh, spoiler alert, have outstanding national reporting on how many students participate in these programs on an annual basis that's uh, super reliable and timely. Uh, but there are a few reports out there that 
um, that do have a lot of value to the field and really understanding and having a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the field. And one of the most often cited ones is the National Center for Education Statistics. And it had a recent report in February 2019 uh, and that one gets a lot of traction and attention. So that was a summary of data gleaned from the high school longitudinal study of 2009, which took about uh, more than 23,000 uh, students that were a representative subpopulation of US high schools and kind of looked at course taking trends in the short and the long term and followed those students for a period of years, administering follow-up surveys, looking at transcript patterns uh, and looking for students popping up in um, post-secondary databases and student clearinghouse data. And there were four kind of key findings from that. Uh, the first one on the slide here is 34% or basically one in three students in the study um, and nationally as a representative sample are participating in these programs and earning college credit, at least one or more college credits in the high school space. I'm probably not unsurprising to this audience, students with a had coming from households and having families with a higher level of education were more likely to participate in dual enrollment. And again, that's pervasive in post-secondary education in general, uh, and it was not shocking to see it here. Also, white and Asian students are significantly more likely to participate that's, than students that identified as Hispanic or Black or reported themselves as uh, multiple, ra multiple race or ethnicity. So the majority of another interesting element, particularly to NASEP, which really works in the overall dual enrollment space, but also particularly the model where the high school instructor is delivering these, col these college courses in the classroom, the majority of dual enrollment, 86% was taken at the high school. So, and that splits out into 80% at the student's home high school and about 6% at uh, either career centers or adjacent high schools in the area. And so while this study gives us a lot of useful information in a variety of areas, it basically is backwards looking data. It tells us a lot about what patterns were happening in that 2009 to 2016 area. Those that have been engaged in this field know that the last decade and five years in particular have seen a lot of growth. So national data can be more backwards looking. And we often lean on things like state data and sometimes other store sources for more better current insights as well. Okay, Alex, you can go to the next slide now. So another way to look at how prevalent student participation is, is to look at the access side of things and see how widely available these programs are. So NCES also provides some insights showing that uh, basically nearly 90% of US high schools are reporting offering these programs. And there's a clear indication that the programs are widely available in this high school longitudinal study. And obviously uh, when you look at the numbers, potentially undersubscribed by students and underutilized. And we'll get into that, uh, particularly when we get into the equity conversations. The prior slide talked about um, states that actually had percentage rates of student participation that were significantly higher than um, the national average. And so you have states for like Indiana and Iowa that have 20% higher rates of student participation than we see on the national average. We also see a result of regionality in terms of what reporting, high schools are reporting in terms of having access, student access for these programs. So we see that the South and the Midwest are uh, kind of leading the pack and that there is work to do in the Northeast as well as the West. So that's kind of the landscape of how well subscribed these programs are, their availability for students on the access element. Alex is gonna talk about um, kind of what the national data tells us about the power and potential of these programs period, but specifically in the equity space. Yeah, so I think, you know, we know that the programs are largely widely available, though, again, as we'll reaffirm later when we, we've got some charts on it, you know, there are significant gaps in terms of access to the programs. Um, but we also know now, based off of about two decades of scholarly research looking at dual enrollment, um, that there are some really quite interesting outcomes for students um, around these programs. There is now, I think, a significant amount of evidence to demonstrate that high school students who have access to college classes are both more likely to access college as a result of taking these courses, and they're more likely to complete college, and that's controlling for other demographic factors, right? I think one of the things that um, when dual enrollment was first established, it was very much 
uh, a program for the acceleration of higher achieving students or the highest achieving students for whom it was a let's not have them be too bored during their high school senior year and so maybe let's get them started on college. The reality of dual enrollment today is very different from that. This is a college engagement and success strategy for many students. Um, and there's actually some interesting research. Uh, it's emerging in the research field, but uh, a number of the studies now that, that the recent studies that have looked at access and success have actually found that low income students and students who are underrepresented in higher education um, were more likely to derive larger positive benefits from participating in dual enrollment than their peers who didn't fall into those categories. So I think there's now a lot of research that demonstrates that these programs are a significant tool in helping students both access college and complete college. The Institute for Education Sciences Whatwick's Clearinghouse did a review of dual enrollment studies in uh, early 2017 and found that there was a, a medium to large degree of evidence to say that those claims around access and success were true. And there are other kind of things that dual enrollment does that were also covered in the intervention report. Um, higher academic achievement in high school, uh, lower need of remediation once the students enter college, um, number of post-secondary credits and rate of, of secondary credit accumulation and also degree attainment as well being that kind of final piece of it. We're also starting to see, particularly within some of the subsets, the kind of more intensive uh, dual enrollment models like the early college high school, um, that th some of the studies have now been running long enough that we can have a look at how students have been doing after um, graduating from college, not just graduating from high school, but now graduating from college and out in the workforce around these programs as well. And they're starting to show some very interesting results around um, students earning potential being higher uh, within five to 10 years of graduation than students who did not participate in dual enrollment. Um, so lots of really great benefits, both in terms of completing high school, accessing college and graduating from college. Um, and there are a number of state level studies too. So this is just one of the most recent ones. This is out of Colorado. Um, Colorado now has quite a large dual enrollment population. There's been quite a lot of state policy. Um, most Colorado uh, dual enrollment um, takes place uh, in the high school. Um, uh, it's it's they, the, the, the Colorado state policy defines it, calls it concurrent enrollment. There is some early college high school, there are some P-TECs. Um, but if you look across the whole of the dual enrollment system, the concurrent enrollment system within Colorado, um, these are some of the outcomes that they have found for those students. And, and to give you a sense of, of the scale of access within Colorado, about one in three high school students in the state of Colorado took a college course in school year 2017, 2018. So they found that the students were 25% more likely to attend college, 8% more likely for on-time degree completion at a two-year college, 10% uh, improvement in on-time degree completion for a four-year college, 9.6% um, higher wages five years post-graduation. This is just looking at um, uh, concurrent enrollment students and comparing them to non-concurrent enrollment students. Um, and as I was alluding to earlier, there's also a really interesting and expanding set of research on the early college high school model in particular. What kind of differentiates an early college high school from your more traditional dual enrollment. These tend to be whole school models. They have more support structures in place baked into the model um, to support students. They actually largely are set up to specifically target and cater to students who are low income, underrepresented in higher education, students of color, et cetera. Um, and they are as part of the sort of definition of being an early college high school, 100% free of charge to the students who participate. Um, still part of that dual enrollment umbrella, but, but you know, sort of uh, a more intensive version of your traditional dual enrollment program. Um, and there's now a significant amount of research on the really high benefits of early college high school participation for students, both significant improvement in access and success alongside the improvement you have um, uh, within dual enrollment as a whole. And also American Institutes for Research has done a long running study on early college high schools um, and just uh, in the last year came back with a return on investment analysis, um, found the average lifetime benefit for a student participating in early college was about $58,000. Um, and their conclusion was that for the uh, resources invested in establishing and running the early college high school versus the lifetime benefits to students, it's actually about a 15 to one benefit to cost ratio um, for the 
establishment of early college high schools. Now, and that's the most expensive of the models, right? That's It's a relatively small movement. There are probably only about 400 early colleges nationwide. Why? Because it's much more expensive than your traditional dual enrollment. Um, uh, but uh, we have also seen on the dual enrollment side, a number of different states have looked at um, return on investment uh, analyses around the sort of more traditional dual enrollment programs and found that, you know, there is also a significant return on investment within the kind of traditional dual enrollment space as well. This, again, out of that Colorado study, um, there are four main claims people make about dual enrollment. Uh, it, uh, it, students are more likely to access college, they're more likely to complete college, um, it will save them time, it will save them money. We can definitely say that on the access, access and success piece, there's a significant amount of research to back that up. On time to degree completion and cost to degree completion, they're very sexy from a policymaker perspective. When legislators talk about these, they talk about that as being the kind of two main reasons to do this. Um, the research base is not as strong on those two claims as they are on the access and success piece, but there is emerging research to demonstrate that maybe that is the case. Um, uh, and this, uh, this slide, which just comes out of that Colorado research shows that um, there actually is a significant savings to Colorado students for engaging in concurrent enrollment uh, over their educational lifetime versus not doing so. So I think we are starting to now see some emerging research to continue backing up all four of those claims. Um, but when we talk about the benefits of, of doing dual enrollment, we're very much focused on that access and success piece, which is a critical challenge, especially as a result of COVID, right? What are we seeing? We're seeing significant declining rates of post-secondary enrollments by high school students. We're seeing some scary warning signs about post-secondary success, um, and obviously uh, a significant need for accelerated learning for a number of students who may have fallen behind as a result of the pandemic. And I think college and high school programs have uh, a part of an answer around some of those challenges, right? Particularly around improving post-secondary enrollment rates, bringing those college experiences into the high school to expose the students to them early um, and kind of let them know that they can do college, make it a viable option for them. Um, uh, I think as states and colleges and school districts are thinking about how do we kind of turn around some of these scary declines in post-secondary enrollments, I would argue dual enrollment has a role to play. Um, it's not the whole answer, but it has a role to play in addressing some of those challenges. Yeah, and I would echo that. And an area that we're seeing interesting research start to move forward also is in the workforce. So, and Alex referenced a couple, referenced a couple studies about the impact on that side as well. And, uh, you know, in some of my former work with governor's ed policy advisors and various state and system offices around the country that were really focused on attainment goal, we talked very frequently about, you know, this is an important arrow to have in your quiver moving forward towards those post-secondary attainment goals. So as I mentioned earlier uh, and kind of highlighted on this slide, there's a lot of variability in the reporting and the actual numbers of students participating in these programs, but there are some common threads and themes that really transcend the various data sets. As I mentioned, we do see um, you know, regionality in participation with some states well over the national participation average and some well under, as you can see here on the left. Um, and like higher education as a whole and other acceleration programs such as AP and IB, there are participation gaps by gender, by race, by ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, parent education level. And you can see here uh, that we see white females overrepresented in their participation. Next slide, Alex. And not unsurprising, we see gaps aligned with those other trends in secondary and post-secondary education that many of us are very familiar with. Students with parents of lower levels of education attainment, students that are of color, black and Hispanic students have lower dual and concurrent enrollment participation rates. Additionally, you know, high poverty, urban, small and specialized high schools are less likely to offer these programs. So that's an issue on the access side as well. As Alex discussed, and this is really kind of a key framing when he and I uh, work together and then just outside when we're working separately, these programs work. It's a matter of how we can make them work for the students that they can disproportionately positively impact and making sure that access is there, the envisioning of feeling like these programs are for me, uh, and then the completion and the support across the board. And these 
mean, or those elements mean that the research has shown very clearly that these can be really impactful equity levers, but like higher education in general and other acceleration programs, there are gaps between the demographics of students uh, in the state and the school district, what those students look like, and then who uh, in turn participates. So instead of helping alleviate these equity gaps and attainment rates in post-secondary education, these trends are showing there's a clear missed opportunity to do some really systemic equity work in the high school to college transition space. And really that's been a crux of a lot of our work within the college and the high school alliance and a lot of our work as an organization at NASEP in general. We wanna really focus the equity lens on policy that can help close these gaps. Now, as I mentioned early, college and the high school alliance really leans in on the state policy and federal policy element while NASEP really speaks the same message to the practitioner side of the house. But we always talk about it in the fact that you don't have to wait for policy to light the way on this. Intentional work at the program level in key areas can have an equally uh, profound and even a grassroots impact. So I'm gonna hand back to Alex to kind of talk about what those key areas look like from a policy standpoint. And then obviously those port into a kind of small P policy, which are institution policy, system policy, community policy. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the perfect setup. We, we know the programs work, but we know they're not reaching the students who could benefit the most from them. So how do we change that? So um, the College and High School Alliance uh, published in partnership with the Level Up Coalition, a um, unlocking potential. It's a state policy roadmap for equity and quality in college and high school programs. I won't walk you through the full report. Suffice to say, if you're interested, it's available at collegeandhighschool.org slash roadmap. Um, but I did just want to quickly talk you through the six components of the framework. And as Amy says, there are there are applicability within this framework for both the policy side, right? Thinking about how we structure policies to support access and success in these programs, but frankly, also at the program side as well. As, as we talk through each of these six elements of the framework, kind of, I think, you know, for those of you who are at the practitioner level, be thinking, how does this apply to the work that we do? Because it definitely does. I mean, some of it is obviously driven by what the state tells you you have to do, but there's still a certain amount of leeway within that to um, determine, you know, what your own practices are at the individual program level. Um, so six part framework, beginning with equity goal and public reporting. Um, how are we being really intentional about saying that, uh, arguing who should be benefiting from participating in dual enrollment um, and what are our data systems in place to ensure that we are collecting data and publicly reporting data around program or state participation and success in these programs such that we can get a really good handle on what on where equity gaps exist and then develop a set of policy or programmatic solutions designed to combat them right it's sort of been uh, we've sort of hinted at it throughout this whole presentation national data collection on dual enrollment is pretty bad right now. Um, and so there is a big uphill uh, uh, battle to climb for us just to get our hands around where the gaps are to be able to then design a customized set of policy solutions to address them. Two, program integrity and credit transfer. Well, credit transfer is obviously a big one. Students are coming uh, out of dual enrollment programs with a college transcript, but not a college transcript that amounts in many cases to a degree or credential. So they ultimately need to take those credits and apply them at a second institution of higher education. So the transfer piece is going to be critical within that. Also questions around um, what are the, how are we ensuring that each of these experiences that students are having, regardless of where they're having it, regardless of who the instructor is, are true college experiences that meet the level of expectations that we would have for a college class for those students. Um, it's the key word, it's quality, but it is an important one um, uh, as it relates to thinking about these programs, especially as we're working to expand access to low income and underrepresented students, right? We want to ensure that those students have access to the same high quality experiences as every other student does, and that we're not just adding what we call dual enrollment for dual enrollment's sake without it actually helping actionably push those students forward on a pathway towards a degree or credential. The finance piece is a big one. How are we ensuring we're eliminating costs for low-income students participating in these programs? It's obviously a big equity barrier if there are costs involved for the students to participate. Course access and availability. What kind of courses do students have access to? How many courses do they have access to? How do they find out about those courses? What are the admissions criteria for participating in those courses? Uh, that's, a you know, the eligibility criteria for participating in dual enrollment is a really important question. 
Um, uh, there are a number of practices that do lead to bad equity outcomes when it comes to dual enrollment admissions, right? I would argue that simply relying upon standardized test uh, outcomes to assess eligibility for dual enrollment is not the correct eligibility mechanism for dual enrollment, that states and programs should be looking at multiple measures of student readiness to assess whether they're ready to start dual enrollment. And there is promising research to demonstrate that using those multiple measures can be much more successful at correctly identifying students who are college ready. Um, instructor capacity is a big one. There are many states that use high school teachers to, to, to do the college class instruction. Many of them do need more um, uh, discipline specific graduate coursework than they have right now. Most lots of teachers have master's degrees, but not many of them have master's degrees in the specific content area. And many states and certainly a number of accreditors, the Higher Learning Commission being the biggest, require that the teachers have those discipline specific graduate coursework in order to teach the courses. And we're in the middle of a teacher workforce crisis as it stands right now, we just don't have enough teachers, let alone enough teachers who have discipline specific graduate training. And then lastly, what are the support services? that the students are receiving. How are the students being advised? Um, how are they being counseled on what courses to select, why to select those courses, right? Ultimately, students should be engaged in dual enrollment with an intention to do something, right? There must be some intentionality behind those course taking experiences. Otherwise, um, you're not actually pushing those for students forward on a pathway to a degree or credential. And before we switch to talking about dual enrollment and COVID is our very last thing. Amy, any last comments on the framework? No, I think that's a really good summary. And I just would encourage those that are on the practitioner side to think about how are you reporting with your, let's say between high school and college partners about the demographics of the school district versus who is participating. Same thing for program equity or integrity and credit transfer. How are you sure that those processes that you have in place are really aligned tightly with real quality standards that have been demonstrated as important and impactful across the board on a national framework like NACEP offers. Uh, finance is a little trickier in terms of, you know, moving from the state into the program level, but we've seen a lot of innovation in that space, bringing in foundation funding uh, for scholarships, bringing in business and industry partners to prioritize removing a cost barrier for student participants. Uh, course access and availability, you hit that really strongly when you're looking at building one of these programs or enhancing or refining or uh, really innovating in them. Where are these credits leading and how does that align with the student's ultimate purpose? I, uh, there's kind of a catchphrase thrown around in, in our side of the house on the, the practitioner side, random acts of dual enrollment. And we wanna move away from that to an intentional pathways so that students really are getting those advances and really stepping forward onto a pathway that ultimately benefits them. Uh, instructor capacity is a, an element that we're seeing a lot of states focus in on, tune in on, and look at efforts. And we're also seeing institutions lead the way to some extent on that through collaborations between two-year and four-year institutions, through collaboration through uh, teacher training programs. So there's a lot of work going in that space. And then navigational supports are incredibly important. Um, and building in this idea that I came from a community college or a two-year college campus, and we did a lot of things that were above and beyond to bridge and support the students. Those things are widely available in the two-year space in terms of you know, having access to a food pantry, having access to math and writing centers, having additional support, um, but have not made as much progress, I think, in the dual enrollment space, even though, especially when these take place in the high school, there is a great framework to help support those additional elements. It's just a matter of figuring out who does what. And of course, given the world that we live in, we'd be remiss not to touch on the impact of COVID-19 on dual enrollment. Um, we are still in the process of unpacking a lot of that. We just have completed a national survey, um, a COVID impact survey of dual enrollment policymakers and practitioners to understand more about how the pandemic has changed dual enrollment. Um, just kind of some early reflections we have is that uh, online dual enrollment existed pre-pandemic, um, but I think there, uh, 50% of respondents to the survey indicated that their program was planning to continue some kind of online dual enrollment availability after the conclusion of the health crisis. That would be a significant expansion in online dual enrollment from where we were in, in late 2019. Um, I think enrollment, the picture has been very mixed. Some, uh, some programs enrollment has been a lot higher as a result of the pandemic and students in um, their localities becoming very focused on um, those sort of short 
shortcut processes to degrees and credentials. In other places, the pandemic has had a really uh, negative impact on enrollment. We've seen significant declines in uh, dual enrollment participation. Uh, what separates one from the other? Um, we're still unpacking why I think cost is probably a driving factor in that, right? If you were a dual enrollment program uh, that was charging students, I think you probably did see your, your enrollment decline. If you were a program that was uh, blessed to be in a position where you don't have to charge students either because of using programmatic funds or specific state funds to support the dual enrollment programs, um, then I think you know you maybe saw either no impact or, or an increase in um, uh, in enrollment. Now, obviously, there's uh, as a result of the various COVID-19 relief funds provided through the CARES Act, the December stimulus bill, and then the American Rescue Plan. Um, there's there are lots of school districts, colleges, and states that are looking to make a lot of decisions about how to invest funding between now and 2024 when that funding expires. And um, so just previewing that the College and High School Alliance will be publishing um, a set of guidance for school districts, for colleges, and for states. It'll be one guidance document, but it touches on all three audiences. It'll be the week after next that will look specifically at how programs can think about using American Rescue Plan funding and the other COVID-19 stimulus funding to support expanding dual enrollment, to support expanding equitable access for dual enrollment, thinking about how do you get some of the tools in place from that framework that we walked you through um, to support longer term improvements in access and success for these programs. Um, just as a really top level highlight, uh, dual enrollment is an allowable use under um, the elementary and secondary education relief fund. The the pot of money that K-12 school districts get, both for the state's reservation of funds and for the school districts. Um, the ESSER allows for funds to be used on anything that's previously been authorized under federal law and dual and concurrent enrollment and early college high school are both allowable uses of funding under ESSA, under Perkins 5. Um, uh, and so they're allowable uses under ESSA as well. On the college side, the higher education relief fund dollars can be used to support dual enrollment, both the institutional dollars that um, the, the colleges get um, in order to uh, respond to COVID-19, but also uh, under the funding provided from the American Rescue Plan, um, the 50% that must be used for emergency student financial aid, that may also be used to support dual enrollment students um, in the form of emergency financial aid. The CARES Act funding from March of last year, that can't be used to support dual enrollment students, but the more recent funding provided through the December stimulus bill and now through the American Rescue Plan can. And some governors have been using the governor's fund in order to support dual enrollment. That's mostly spent down at this point, but we've seen that happen in states like Alaska, Montana, and um, Tennessee. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in more about the guidance or any of the resources that we talked about today, uh, you can find them over at collegeandhighschool.org. Um, here is uh, my contact information and Amy's contact information. We're always thrilled to talk more about dual enrollment, uh, whether it's in the policy context or the practice context. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. And I think we have about 10 minutes left for questions. And we are happy to answer questions about anything we've talked about in this presentation or anything else that's on your mind in the dual enrollment college and high school program space. Um, I promise you there are very few questions that we can't answer. So um, if there's anything in this space that you're curious in asking us about, we are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Amy. We do have a couple of questions. Real quick, I want to put in a plug. I mentioned the Complete College America podcast, CCA on the air. The most recent episode actually focuses on concurrent enrollment where I had a conversation with Carla McBain, She's the director of the University of Missouri, Kansas City High School College Dual Credit Partnership. Also something very important to say. She's also the member at large representative on the NASAP board. And so we spoke about the different models of concurrent enrollment, quality standards, and the impact of race on successful programming. Uh, really engaging conversation. So I would encourage people to check that out. So the first question, and I'm hoping you can answer this because it, it requires both of you to look into your crystal ball and to prognosticate. Um, which is, you know, you've talked about the trends that we've seen so far, um, some of the difficulties of even being able to find some of that data. So, you know, um, notwithstanding another pandemic, where do you see concurrent enrollment going over the next five years? Do you credit, you know, the, the whole, yeah. I you see it. Yeah, I see it continuing prominence. And I, you know, I come from an analytical background. So I see that we were on a growth curve from what we could tell, especially when we referenced national data with um, state level data. 
Um, so we were on a growth curve. I think we're going to get a little bit of flattening, although Alex didn't want to take a stab or a, or a huge committing stab to kind of where programs really uh, that saw large enrollment hits, uh, why that was. I think a lot of that really happens to be how baked into education in a particular state or region or school district these programs are, because uh, our read on it as an organization that's really in the, the, the trenches with practitioners is that areas that saw these as kind of icing on the cake or nice to have I uh, did not prioritize them in the pandemic. And that's not a you know consternation of that or a criticism. Let's get real. This was a really tough situation to navigate. Whereas areas, school districts, states that had built this into statute or policy, or it was general practice that everybody engaged in, had a lot easier time working their way mentally through, okay, this is something we do, something we've always done. So how are we going to continue to do it? Um, getting back to the kind of that growth trajectory, what we're seeing at the state level that I think I'm most attuned to and paying attention to is higher ed is dealing with a lot right now in terms of like consolidation, decreasing enrollment, decre and before that decreasing po high school population. Uh, community colleges didn't see a big enrollment boom like they did from the, uh, the past recession. And so there's a lot to be determined in this space, but we are still seeing that uh, institutions, systems, states are making the case for these programs. They continue to have value. I think we're going to see some expansion into the online area, which will do a lot to cover some of the equity issues. And I think we're going to see a lot of focus on quality in that not just quality, what constitutes a quality program, what creates a program framework that allows students to actually make that um, movement towards something in their future that has value to their future, but what constitutes quality education in the online space that's both engaging, timely, personalized, uh, and I think dual enrollment fits really, really well into that. I think there's a really difficult conversation coming on the way in which we fund these programs and to whose benefit do we fund them, right? I think we've seen that growth in dual enrollment has reached the point where for a number of states that have really invested in growing the model, they have sort of reached capacity in terms of what the state is willing to invest in the programs, but equity gaps remain in terms of participation. And so if it's the case that you're starting to bump up against ceilings in terms of what state legislators are willing to chip in in order to pay for the programs, there then becomes this question of, okay, now we've kind of defined the universe of funding that's available and we know we just can't ask for more, 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 more. How are we then going to think about redirecting some of that? And that's going to be very difficult because I think it should be redirected towards serving the students who have the highest need, right? Mm -hmm. um, who are the lowest income for whom they do not have the ability to, you know, pay the costs associated with the courses, the book costs, the transportation costs, the fee costs. The problem is a lot of the populations that are benefiting from those free dual enrollment programs at the moment also happen to be very politically active and connected and put together. And so it's going to create this really, it's going to create a tension between, you know, we know we have a, a, a limited amount of funding available. How are we investing that funding? Some of that could be ameliorated by um, uh, a federal investment potentially, I think, you know, we're sort of reaching the point where a federal state partnership is almost certainly going to be an essential path forward for um, really expanding access to all students, but particularly being focused on um, uh, those students who are underrepresented in the programs right now. But uh, yeah, I think um, uh, I don't want to say that dual enrollment is about to become a victim of its own success, but I think the the days of, of sort of, um, of of unrelenting increase without there being a very serious conversation about what that means from a policy perspective and who is benefiting from it is it, it it's starting right now. I'm going to counterpoint that because I do think that we're in a space where, I mean, let's be honest, there is a lot of talk of equity in, you know, state legislatures and state houses. There's a lot of talk on institution campuses, but there really needs to be a thoughtful approach. Uh, and I think there's been a learning space where people have talked about, you know, the, the simple diagram of what equity is. Putting each person on the same height platform is not equity. People need that. Uh, some people need more support, different support different modes of support than others. So I think as Alex kind of teed up, and we had conversations when we were seeing state budgets look pretty grim, probably what, eight months ago, I mean, not that that has entirely changed, about if you're going to cut a budget line item that supports these programs, 
then do it thoughtfully. I mean, yes, you have to cut that budget line item, but really have an intentional equity focused conversation about who gets these funds. So you could take that. And since you know that the population you really should be engaging and supporting financially with these programs is not the largest part of the population that's engaging in them, use that, pull out the students that are getting the same benefit um, whose parents make $400,000 as the student that their parents make $30,000 in a year. Uh, make sure that you're being intentional and leveling and, you know, be willing to be accountable with that data. And I know that's difficult in terms of tracking and data sharing, but difficult does not mean you shouldn't do it. Uh, difficult often means that it is worth paying attention to. Great points. We just have two more minutes left, so I want to ask for just a quick answer on this other question that we have, which is about authenticity in college courses. And I saw from people introducing themselves, we have a lot of concurrent enrollment and dual credit directors. But still, how would you respond to the critique when people say, but these aren't real college classes, or how do you address the non-academic sides of what it means to be a college student while you're in high school? So quick answer, just because we have a couple minutes left. Yeah, I think you have to look at how, how the program is being run and what intentional supports are built in their structural elements to ensure that. And I think you have to do a lot of professional development with college faculty and high school instructors. Because when you look, I, I was just on a conversation with the state yesterday, they looked very carefully at student performance data coming into their system uh, through students that had taken this concurrent enrollment model. Uh, and they found no differential between students that had taken it on campus and students that had enrolled uh, on campus via dual enrollment. So I think you have to use bring data to the conversation. I think you have to look at structurally what you're doing to ensure continuity. I think high school instructors need to understand what the college environment is like and how and be supported by their administration to hold that line and ensure that they are uh, bringing that integrity piece. Because when we look at research, students benefit proportionally much better when not just the rigor is there, but the non-cognitive support is there, the, uh, you know, the emphasis on time management, more of those executive skills, um, the drop of hand-holding, and even things as simple as like not requiring assigned seating, which is pretty pervasive in the high school environment, not at all an element in the college environment. So I think that, you know, go to the data, look at the research, build the structure that supports the program that you want, and any college that's participating in this space wants that integrity and that authenticity. And any high school instructor that's participating in these programs also wants that. And I would just say real quick that the, we're in the process of doing a, a, a literature review for research that's already been done on dual enrollment. And according to the current research, there's no, there's, there's no evidence that there's really that much difference between a student taking a college class in the high school environment versus taking it in the college environment. I mean, I know that there's a big perception difference between those, but so far the research is not backing up that there's an outcomes different for those students. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Again, it's been my distinct pleasure and honor to be able to host this conversation with Amy Williams from the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships, or NISA, and Alex Perry from the College and High School Alliance. Uh, thank you for all the attendees who were here. We encourage you to come back in two weeks on June 3rd at the same time, 3 o'clock Eastern time. We're going to be focusing on adult learner engagement. Again, you can find out more at completecollege.org. Until then, thank you for joining us.